Great. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, well, since 1964, uh, we've tried it the Democrats' way. Uh, according to the Heritage Foundation, we've spent $22 trillion fighting the war on poverty as a result. Adjusted for inflation, this is three times more than all of the military wars we have ever fought combined. Put another way, it's $176,000 taken from the lifetime earnings of every family in America over those 50 years. We've created 92 different federal anti-poverty programs in this effort. And I think after 50 years of experience with these programs, we're entitled to ask, how's the war on poverty coming? Well, in 1966, the poverty rate stood at 14.7 percent. Today, it's 13.5 percent. Twenty-two trillion dollars, and 50 years later, poverty has barely budged. Republicans have warned for years of the poverty trap. The, the practical effect of these programs is to trap generations in poverty by robbing them of the incentive to succeed and denying them the dignity, the indescribable feeling of self-worth that comes with a paycheck. As the old adage says, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man how to fish, and he'll eat for a lifetime. This budget is predicated on this simple principle. If you're able-bodied with no dependents, in return for your welfare benefits, we ask that you look for a job or train for a job, and if a job's offered, we expect you to take it. According to Forbes, when Maine applied this condition, 90% of this population found work, and within a year, their incomes rose 114 percent. Let me repeat that. The income of these welfare recipients rose 114 percent in the first year once the work requirement took effect. Alabama had similar results this year when 13 counties implemented work requirements for SNAP. The reforms in this budget are specifically designed to change the incentives to get people back into the workforce so that they, too, can see their income soar along with their self-respect and dignity. They also assure that we can focus more resources on those who can't fend for themselves. Not only do the Democrats propose keeping people trapped in poverty with their programs, but they also propose to harm the economy, robbing people of the opportunity to succeed. Taxing the top 1% might make a good bumper sticker, but it hurts the very people they say they're trying to help. The vast majority of American businesses are individuals filing under subchapter S, and most of that income is already taxed in the top bracket. Businesses don't pay business taxes. The only three ways that a business tax can possibly be paid is by us as consumers through higher prices, by us as employees through lower wages, and by us as investors through lower earnings on our retirement savings. And as Arthur Laffer has often warned, and my home state of California is again discovering, there is nothing more portable in this world than money and rich people. High taxes have already sent hundreds of billions of dollars of capital offshore. So let me repeat this for my Democratic colleagues. The only way a business tax can be paid is by consumers through higher prices, employees through lower wages, and by investors through lower earnings as those taxes are passed along. And that's, by the way, on the earnings side, it's mainly the retirement plans. Our tax plan produces more affordable products for consumers, higher wages and more jobs for employees, and higher returns for people's retirement funds. Now, there was a time when Democrats supported these policies. That's what John F. Kennedy accomplished through the tax cuts in the early 1960s, reminding us that a rising tide lifts all boats. Because of these failed policies of the last 50 years, our nation is now more than $20 trillion in debt. The only way that we're going to escape a fiscal and economic collapse is to restore the growth rates we had after Reagan cut the top tax rate from 70 percent down to 28 percent. When he did that, the economy grew at twice the rate it is now, and tax revenue skyrocketed from $599 billion to $991 billion. Put more simply, Reagan cut tax rates by more than half and tax revenues nearly doubled. He, uh, history teaches us that lesson very clearly. In the last 60 years, the top income tax rate's been as high as 91%, it's been as low as 28%,
but income tax revenues have stayed remarkably steady between 13 and 20 percent of GDP. Indeed, some of the lowest income tax revenues came when the top tax rate was at its highest, and some of the highest revenues came when the top rate was quite low. But although the tax rate within this envelope has remarkably little effect on revenues, it has a huge impact on economic growth. The success of our poverty programs is not how much we spend on them, it's how many people are lifted out of poverty. The Democratic anti-poverty programs have spent $22 trillion fighting poverty and the poverty rate has barely budged. It seems the more we invest in our mistakes, the less willing we are to admit them. I think it's time we connected the dots between poverty and the Democratic policies. Has it escaped anyone's attention that the cities with the most entrenched Democratic machines, the cities where Democrats have had their way for generations, are the very same cities where poverty and unemployment are off the charts and where kids are trapped in failing schools with no way out. This is the unbroken legacy of the Democrats' policies, and you see it vividly in any government they've controlled unopposed for more than a decade. I don't think there's a single exception to this rule. This budget charts a new course for our nation using policies that have proven time and again to dramatically improve the lives of those who've been victimized by the Democrats' poverty trap. The policies called forth by this budget have time and again produced economic growth and prosperity for our country. It is time that we had a rebirth of freedom. It is time for another morning to dawn in America. It's time to make this country great again. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back.